So, let me thank you one more time for bringing me here to speak to our people. Um, I've tried, I'll try as much as possible to stay within the context of time. And since we still have time for questions, I hope I'll still be able to stay for the questions. Please, um, my slides, please. Oh, okay, not only here. Oh, okay. Ah, I, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I'm here today. Please sit down. Ah, okay. Um, you know, there's something that, why I'm pleased for pastor bringing me here is this. For too long a time, I think the church has been sleeping. I don't mean redeem alone. I mean the church generally about the context of things that are the realities of our society today. And so we preach, we do someone, we do conferences like this, but we forget about some of the realities that we even as Christians face every time. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. Um, what, what, what I've done, and I'm sure you've seen, uh, I'm going to talk about, I tweaked the topic a bit. I, I, they wanted me to talk about mental health, then I tweaked it to mean the role of the family and the church in dealing with mental health and substance abuse. I'm sure these are two things that people think happen to other people, and that it doesn't happen in the church. That's not true. We have found out to our own pain and regret that this is even probably worse in the church. So well, I've tried today to talk to some of these things, to open our eyes to the reality of the moment so that we can be prepared. You said we are soldiers, we want to die at our post. It's nice to die, but it's nice to die for what is purposeful, so that at least we know. And then we, we can also help our family members and members of the church. Uh, in the presentation outline, I said I, I'll pick on some relevant Bible verses to guide us. One of them is Matthew 13, 25. My, I, I'm sure we all know it uh, for those, particularly those of, uh, those of you who are pastors. Oh, okay, we are ready. The role of the family and the church in dealing with mental health and substance abuse. Next slide, please. This, uh, this is the outline of how I want to speak. Relevant Bible verse. And then, okay, go back, sir. That, that's fine. The first one is this, Matthew 13, 25. It says, but while men slept, the enemy came and did what? He saw tears and did what? He went his way. And that is what I can tell you is happening in the church. Until now that people are beginning to wake up to the reality of the moment. The next one is Hosea 4, 6 a. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Many times we think as Christians, next slide, sir. We think as Christians... We don't need to know some of these things. It's not true. And also what I've tried to do is to define some of the terms that I'm using. If you look at it very well, the family, the individual is basically sitting in the center. And then the family, and then the church, and the society, because that is how we interact. That is how we interact as a person. The individual is just a person, a member of the family. And then the family... A group of one or more parents, please could you take off? Hello, sir. Okay, yes. Not, no, don't take off that. I, I, I'm not important. This is what is important. A group of more parents and their children living together as a unit. That's the meaning of a family. I say a group, a parent, or one or two parents, because sometimes one can die or one cannot be there, but it doesn't mean that it's not a family unit. What is the church? The church is a building in there for public Christian worship. It is a sanctuary. It's supposed to be a sanctuary where God's people gather to share fellowship and provide succor to one another. We need to begin to ask ourselves whether we'll fulfill that. In the context of our meeting, the way we deal with one another, 
do we satisfy that definition? And what is health? According to what, until 1940, people used to think that health means uh, somebody has to be sick or uh, infirm. But now we know that according to WHO, it is a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Next slide, sir. You know why I want to, I'm zeroing on this too. The issue of mental health is becoming very prominent, extremely prominent. There's nothing, you, you, you cannot be in complete health if your mental state is poor. And I'll show you some of these things, and I'll speak to them and then speak to the other part. Look at this. She's a female with a family. She had a husband and had a son. She had personal fortune of between $100 and $150 million. She sold her business in 2017 for a whopping $2 billion, $2.4 billion. Sometimes toward the end of 2018, she committed suicide by hanging. Her name was Kate Spade. I'm sure most women will know her. She deals in all those, yes, all those, mad, very, I mean, you can then imagine, you will wonder in yourself, why would she commit suicide? With all this money, with everything she had, a woman we want to have a son, we want to have a husband, she did. And she had a big business. Look at the next one. This man was a TV celebrity. Some of you will know him. He was known for his international travels, discussing and writing on local international cuisine. He was an author and a documentarian, although with a past history of drug addiction. He used to take cocaine and crack. While son had not, of, he, he had left it and started working. He was doing where he had family. He was on official assignment in France in 2018 in his hotel room in France. He committed suicide. His name was Anthony Baudouin of CNN. How many of us know him? You see him, ebullient, jumping around and this... But you can then imagine, why would he commit suicide? We're going somewhere. There was a man called Andy Williams. He was a world-renowned actor and comedian who was making millions around the world smile. He would stand up, he would make people laugh and all that. Do you know what happened to him? Forget, it makes people forget their own sorrows and pains. But in 2014, he committed suicide by hanging. You know, these are names that I know some of you will know. Now, let me say this. Look at this number four. This person, a man or a woman, he finds it difficult to sleep at night. He sweats in his palms and armpits, suffers from poor appetite, and conse consequently, a weight loss. Sometimes, he binges on food and then soft drinks with excessive weight gain. His hand sometimes shakes. On contrary, and he fries over virtually everything. All of this affected his work and relationship. Do we know who that person is? You may not know because it is you. <laughs> Check it. You will see that some of these things happen to you when we're anxious, when we're worried, when we're disturbed. And that's why it's so important that we deal with this issue. Let me tell you a story I'm not sure whether you read it. This is about a member of the Redeemed Church. She was a, she's a regional accountant. I won't mention the region. She wrote it herself on Facebook. She was in church. She was coming to work. She's married. She's doing everything. Nobody knew she was depressed for six months. She was almost at the point of committing suicide. A member of the church. And she was mixing with everybody in the church. Mixing in the office. She wrote the story herself. She said she then knew how easy for people to die. There was a lady that you all read, I think it was early last year or late last year, a big woman in a bank. Everybody respected her. What did she do? She committed suicide. You know why this thing is so important in church? We assume too much as a people. Oh, he comes to church now. No, he sings in the choir now. He's an usher. He's one of our pastors. Though. He's doing well. He's married. He has a big car. That does not make for happiness. It doesn't make for fulfillment. And that's why the church must begin to talk about this issue. 
particularly the issue of family. Because the issues we are seeing in our nation today emanate from this. Where is the role of the family anymore in the church? It's nice for churches to be big. I like your church, Pastor, it's very big. But in my own context, the, I prefer a smaller church. If Pastor sits here and begins to talk, how many people can he see? How many people can he know? And there'll be people griping in the church who needs him more than those who sit in front. What I'm saying, I'm not saying you should reduce the size of your church. Oh. I'm only saying, shall we begin to wake up as individuals and love one another as we said about the church? Is it a place that is providing soccer for people? How much truly do we love one ourselves, one another? We talk about love because we speak about it, but we don't do it. How many of our members don't we suddenly don't see and we don't worry? Unless, you know the Bible in Genesis, the Bible said, I don't know the chapter, Pastor, we know, it will tell you later. He said, God will come down in the cool of the evening to do what? To fellowship with Adam and Eve. That was the basis of uh, um, creation. It wasn't for any other thing. God could sit in the heavens and not care. But the Bible said he would come in the cool of the evening to share fellowship. Are we sharing fellowship? Many of our members are dying because of this simple thing. Many of our people are doing drugs. Because of this. Do you know when people go into alcoholism, if you ask why, it is this mental issue. He's just lost his job. His wife just left him. They've been looking for a child for seven years. And the families, you know, unless God helps us, we're deceiving ourselves. Why am I saying so? A woman will marry, she will not have a child. Who are the people that will first cause problems? Women. The mother of the husband. As if marriage is supposed to be the reason, children is supposed to be the reason for marriage. It's not. It's companionship. I'm not saying it's not good to have children, but it's not ultimate. It's not. Paul did not marry, yet we write about Paul. Next slide, sir. Because I may still come to some of these things later. Now, one thing that should frighten us in church is the issue of substance abuse. Don't deceive yourself that because you are a Christian, you can't use drugs. It is not true. There is no university in this country that does not have a drug problem. I don't care which one. One of the students told me in the university, which is a Christian university, I don't want to mention, that if they take 10 people at random, Boys and girls, they test them, at least six, seven will be positive. There are children, no? There are children. But I know why people don't talk about it or like to talk about it. It's because of stigma. So that when you, you bring your child that is doing drugs, everybody will look, ah, don't play with that child. They will let him not teach you how to use drugs. That's not the way we can help you. We need to change. Maybe that's why I'm here today. Let me show you statistics. This is not my statistics. From global survey, in 2017, the UNODC decided to do a survey, global survey about prevalent rate of use of drugs. They then, found, they then published results in 2018. Do you know what they found out? The global prevalence rate was 5.6. Nigeria's zone was 14.4, almost triple. Which meant that at that time, about 14.3 million Nigerians were on drugs. By 2020, when Mr. Stubbs spoke, he had risen to about 25 million. And that is conservative estimate, because we know, really cannot know. Because people think only oh, cocaine or marijuana is drug, is not true. Alcohol is. I'll show you. They found also globally, if you gather 20 people, one of them will be a user. In Nigeria, you just need to gather seven people. I'm not saying if you count seven one day here, or no. That's not what I'm saying. But what it means is the frequency and regularity of which people use drugs is so common. 
I can tell you, I can tell pastor, if you walk down your street, it won't take you 10 minutes to find where they sell it. It won't. Maybe selling it outside your gate, you will not know. Out of every four users in Nigeria, one is a female. So you begin to know the significance. One is a female. That is 25% of drug users. Hey, but 11 million Nigerians use cannabis. That is Igbo. I'll come to it. The highest rate of drug use was found within the age bracket of 25 to 39. You know, if you know the significance of that age range, you'll be scared. That is the economic sector of any nation. And you know the thing that should worry us today? The age of use is coming down. How many of us know Akala? You don't know. Ah. <laughs> okay, if you don't know, don't better, better don't to know. If I, if I take, I'll be careful about what I say because I hear everybody else is hearing. I can tell you in this nation, in Lagos, there is no street that they don't sell drugs. I don't care where you live. You may live in Lekki. That is even headquarters. If you go to, um, there's a place called, I've forgotten the name suddenly now. It's the headquarters of marijuana. Until 2013, Nigeria used to deceive itself that it was a transit nation. Oh, no, 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 they just carry it. I told the director then, the head of NGLA, we met at an international conference. And he was saying, I said, oh, God, don't be saying it to where people know. Come to, let, let me show you joints. You will know that it's not true. We are using. Until 2013, they agreed. But you know what should frighten us today? We manufacture. NDLA has discovered at least 30 laboratories in Nigeria where they manufacture. And that's the one they can see. You know, to manufacture this drug, you don't need more than a little corner. Just a little kitchen. You know they found the man in VGC who was using the kitchen of his house. His wife lives there, his little child, they live all together and was cooking methyl crystal in his house. In Lekki, VGC. It's not Mushion. So that you don't say, ah, it's only Moto Park Boy. It's not true. If you know people who are sitting in offices today who use it, you'll be shocked. There's no profession that is scared, spared. I've seen doctors who use and they're still practicing. Yes. Last year, they suspended 14 Nigerian pilots who tested positive to marijuana. So don't sit down and say, eh, your driver may be using. That is the reality that I want all of us to wake up with. Your gardener. Anyone who works for you that is not your family, maybe you, even your children can be using in your house and you'll not be any wiser. Lagos say has the, in the geopolitical consideration, when they then broke Nigeria down to geopolitical consideration, they found that the Southwest has the highest rate, 22.4%. Follow, and then they then did, in the Southwest, they then broke it down into states. They found that Lagos State has the highest in Nigeria, 33%. We should be worried. Ekiti has the lowest, 11.9. Next slide. But it's not the statistics that is important. It is what do we do as a people. So why are they commonly used drugs in Nigeria? For clarity, I just broke into four. Easy, so you can remember. Socially acceptable drugs, alcohol and cigarette. Excuse me, look. You know why they call it socially acceptable? We need to worry because the government knows that for economic reasons, they cannot ban alcohol. So it's available. How many of us know the sachet? I should have brought some samples for you to see. No, it's true. I think it's in my car. I'll carry them around. So, you know, you just see it. You say, I want a check. If you read the contents of these things, you'll be shocked. How many of us know Alamo bitters? Eh? Have you ever read the label, sir? Do you know the level of alcohol in it? 42%. And it's bitters. There's one called Adonko. It's also from Ghana. You know, Ghanaians make this thing for us. When they first brought, they bought it small, small. When they saw that we like it very well, they did big bottles. 
So we are using it and destroying ourselves. You know, alcohol is the only drug that affects every organ of the body. Every organ. And they did a survey in Oxford. They found that it's not the, qu it's not the quantity. It is just the fact that you take it. Because people react different ways to these things. So we must say, I don't take too much. I just take four bottles. Okay. With the weight. But nobody's going to do anything. You will see a yeah, yeah. All kinds of names. You'll be shocked with your, any bitters you see at all. Go and check it. Action bitters, 40% alcohol. I'm saying this thing because it's what you can check and see. Now they said they want to ban it. It is too late. It is too late. If you ban it, they'll be selling it on that table. Let me move on. Illicit drugs. Illicit drug, you know, be illicit because it's illegal. You are not supposed to have it. Marijuana, skunk. <laughs> Let me... Okay, those of you are not listening. Skunk. You know skunk? Almost of this, they call it weed. It is not true. It is not. Skunk is not ordinary weed. Skunk is a combination of cannabis plus dry leaves of purple and cocaine. That's why it's a bit more expensive. There's something called heroin, you know, cocaine, you know, methic, methic crystal. Is anybody from the East here? They call him Kurimiri. That's what they call Kurimiri. It's crystal methyl, methyl crystals. That's why I said they were manufacturing. It's so common today in Lagos, virtually most young people use it, students. It's called ice on the street because it looks like ice. You know, the thing also why I worry about this marijuana, the weed. Many times when they bring these students to us who have been suspended from school, they say, I say, what do you, they say, I use weed. I say, what kind of weed? They just call it weed for them. Some are synthetic, like Arizona, Colorado, Canadian Loud. Can't you see the names? That's how they lure them. If you see anybody who uses Colorado, they can't stand straight. They'll be going like that and going like that. If you also see Arizona, you know the, the terrible thing about this is some people flee from it and they never return normal. You then go and be looking for... There was one boy in Abia State University who took it. So when he began to misbehave, his friends locked him in the room. They wanted to go and look for Gary. Before they came back, he opened the door, jumped, and he died. Three-story building. Look, you know what these things do? It changes the way a man thinks or thinks or sees things. And so go to Yaba, you will see. Go to Aro, you will be surprised. We are not being serious as a people. But God is going to help us. Prescription drugs. You know, these are the ones that we give in hospital that somehow people have found out that they can use for other benefits. Codeine containing cough syrup. If you see any young man drinking Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola or La Casera or any drink for more than 15 minutes, it is not normal. Something is inside. Two days ago, a young boy came to me and said, his classmate will always be drinking Viju milk. You know Viju milk? Yes. Nothing is innocent anymore. If you see anyone slightly using something beyond normal, it is not ordinary. They will have put something. You say, if you see a child with Viju Mig, why will you say anything? You will not. You say, okay, okay, okay. Viju Mig, something is inside. And our children are falling prey to these things. And they come to church. You know, we have an Abekuta center where we admit undergraduates, graduates, professionals, and workers. Since we started in 2019, we've seen about 70 people, about 40 about 50, some of them are students from Christian universities. 
And out of those number of 55, about 40 are the sons and daughters of pastors. In, sometimes in Redeem, sometimes in uh, Deepa and all the, anywhere. And somebody said to me, ah, how can these children use drugs when they have been brought up in the will of the Lord? I said, show me how. Bringing a child to church does not mean you are leading the will of the Lord. What is the example you are choose, showing? A, a boy said to me, my father beats my mom and is a pastor. So you want to preach to him to follow Christ. Excuse me, we have to wake up. Let me tell you this story. They brought a girl to me about 10 years ago, must be. She was 17. The father was a pastor, the mother a pastor in Redeem. I won't tell you which area, so you won't go and be checking. So it, was, it wasn't the parents that brought, it was the sister in the teenage church. So I said, what happened? She started drinking at 12. Her father had the bar in the house. So I asked her, is the Holy Spirit drinking beer? Why would you keep a bar in your house if you don't drink? So the child would drink and add water so that they never knew. So at age 13, she met a young man, an undergraduate on Facebook. They became friends. So they were chatting. So this girl said, when I, mean, someone, when I get up, my mommy shouts too much. Women, listen, no. We shout too much, and it's true. She shouts too much, so in order to cool down, take alcohol. Ah, the boy said, that is not strong enough. That after a few minutes, he will die. Of. He said, I will show you something else to take. That when she shouts for a whole day, you won't even know. You know where they met? They met at the church building in Yaba. I won't mention the church. The boy introduced her to cocaine. He started taking cocaine at 13. The parents did not know she was in the choir. She used to sing. The brother plays drums in the choir. Until one day she called the auntie and said, Sister, I'm tired. I want to stop. But don't tell my parents. So they brought her. I said, no, there's no way we can take her without our parents knowing. So the mother followed her. For you to know how parents enable their children. She followed them. She began to rage. Why did you say this? I said, madam, sit here, JJ. They bring your daughter. I don't know her. It's not me you'll be quarreling with. Shall we do something to help this girl? Eventually, she left the church with the child. But you know the painful thing for me? The girl lives in the joint now. At that time, she had been admitted to read banking and finance. Dream aborted. My slides are. You know, another, you know, all of us have heard about tramadol. You know, tramadol is a drug used in hospital to treat moderate and severe pains. The maximum dosage you see in hospital is 50 milligrams. But can I tell you something? The tramadol they sell on the street to our children starts from 225. 225 milligrams, 250, 500, 1,000 milligrams. And you know, when they take it after where it destroys the brain, they begin to have epileptic attacks. Sometimes it kills them. Many of those young people, they say they died in their sleep. It's drug overdose. Particularly those musicians. And they are the role model for our children. One that is scary today is sicklers. You know, sickles, people with sickle cell, they are beginning to be addicts. Because somehow they were treated with injection of pentazosin in hospital. And if you are given injection of pentazosin, no matter how bad the pain, in five minutes you will jump up. So they now see that they don't need to come to hospital to get it. They can get it anywhere in the chemist. They call it for twin. Let me quickly move. I'm looking at the time. There's one we call miscellaneous. You wonder why we call it miscellaneous. Because you don't know how you can call it a drug. That's why today we don't call it drug anymore. We say substance abuse. How can you call a nail polish remover a drug? Methylated spirit. How do you want to call it a drug? And also, gum. 
rubber, evo stick, petrol, diesel. How do you want to call them drugs? The other one, pit latrine. You know pit latrine? They will go early in the morning, open it, and sniff it. Because it has methane. They also, if you notice those people gather stuff on the dunk hill, they will gather the thing and put fire to it and stand around it and inhale it. Or gutter that has not flowed for a long time. You know, these things, it depends on how much you have. If you don't have money, you will take those small, small ones. A young girl, when I talked in a church, told me her sister, 12 year old, that anytime they go to buy petrol, she will stand near the dispenser. She was inhaling petrol. The other ones, how many of us, is anybody from the north here? There's none. No, I don't mean you take, but I just want to say something. There's something in the north they call Zakami. Zakami seed is naturally occurring. People use it in the north. Extremely potent. NDLA is trying to assess what is in it. I'm, my, most of us are southerners, Abi. How many of us know Gegemu? Gegemu. Gegemu is a naturally occurring plant. Oh, somebody knows it here. You know, Gegemu is like a plant. People plant at the back of the house to drive snake. It also has fruits like this that is rough. You know, it was in one university that we went to talk that they told me that if you pluck the leaves and you boil it like, uh, as if you are boiling vegetables, you can't take it neat or it's extremely potent. They would decant the fluid, put it in bottles and give you small, small at parties. When they don't have, they can also get the fruits. They will dry the fruits and grind it and use it as snuff or put it in drinks. Please, please, I tell parents, I tell our children, if they have to go to a party, let them eat or drink from home. There is nothing that is safe anymore. Even the packeted drinks, they will inject it. So you can't say, ah, do you know today you cannot eat cake anyhow? You, uh, brownies. And you know more. They call it brownies or they call it cookies. There was a time they did a survey among those who bake cakes. People would call them, can you please make us hashish cake? They say, I don't know. They say, we will, they will buy the uh, marijuana themselves and give to the person doing it to put it. I've seen not, young, only, not only young people, I've seen married women who took it at the party without knowing. I know some of us who know something called scoochies. Yeah. Scoochies is another one. It's fluid. It's liquid. You know, they take something like strawberry or black currant. They will soak marijuana in it. They will put tramadol. They will pour cough syrup. And then they will put in small, small cups with ice cube. Very sweet. I never taken before. But they tell me it's very sweet. And But you know what? They sell these things around churches and schools. 200 naira. Ah, may God help us. Now, so why, why do people do drugs? You know, let me tell us something and let us be careful. Because as Christians, we, may, we, are like, we like to be judgmental. He can use it innocently without knowing. If he's coming from lecture and he's very hungry and he sees his friend eating beans and he says, oh, ah, ah, come, come. he can eat it there. They use it to cook beans, jollof rice, fried rice, and pepper soup. And so if the person takes it and he doesn't know, and suddenly he feels that anytime he takes it, he feels cool. He will be going back to take it. They use it to garnish noodles. I hope you know that. Even some of the people who sell noodles, if you see anybody going to a particular place to buy noodles too much, it's not just noodles. Though. And let me also tell parents, if you see dispatch rider coming to your house too regularly, that is wahala. It's not food. Despite riders carry it. Because people, 
Ah, God will help us. Do you know people don't need to leave the house to go and buy this stuff? They call and you'll be delivered. And when they deliver to your mega that night you are sleeping, the mega will come and knock the boy's window and give him the supply. That is why, we, you know this thing about mental health and drug? Observe and the power of observation is so critical. Let me tell you this. A woman came from Calabar, like about 15 years ago, to come and see me. She brought her son, 17. As they were coming, I could see that there was anger in the face of this boy. So they sat down. The woman said, ah, doctor, they said, you come and see you. They gave me a number from Calabar. I said, what is it? She's a medical doctor, the medical director of a teaching hospital. And then the husband, the professor. So he said, the doctor said, but this is my son. The boy said, who is your son? You call me your son now. You want to talk about me. What do you know about me? When I come to you, you say you are busy. When I go to my father, I say, can't you say I'm very busy? Excuse me, can I tell you something? If your child comes to you and says, Daddy, I want to say, oh, can't you say I'm busy? And you say, come back. If you call him back in 20 weeks, we never ask you the same question. Never. They have tested you that you don't have time. And they will not tell you. Let me also tell you, those who are counselors, or your church counselor, people come and say, I'd like to see our counselor if she comes. And sit down, you want to test you, Neil? We say, Auntie, she's 15 now. We say, I, my boyfriend wrote, hey, boyfriend care. The moment you react like that, Otiton, she will not speak again. She has tested you with small fact, you are falling down. What she now tells that she slept with him yesterday. So I'm telling us, you know, it looks funny, but please, can we have time for our children, please? I'll come to it. Let me just quickly go. Experimentation purposes. That's how they try it. If you know the range of things that people can use in this country today, you will not believe it. They test it. People will put urine plus uh, Tom Tom. How they know, I don't know. Abroad, people were carrying the sanitary pads of women and soaking it and using it. People are using... How will somebody know that the white part of lizard dung... You know, when lizard dung stool and left, they will gather the white things and begin to smoke it. I'm telling you what I know. It's not that I'm telling you a story. People in Southeast Asia, they take a uh, scorpion. After killing the scorpion, they will dry it and then they will sniff it. I don't... We went to talk in a church. A boy stood up, a Christian a redeemed church. The boy stood up and said, excuse me, sir. My classmate, they sniff nutri -C. You remember nutri -C? You will say he's innocent, but they try it. And somehow he will do something to somebody and he tells his friend that this thing is cool. Oh. Will you stop a child from using nutri -C? Effect of dysfunctional family system. Parents, when you are fighting at home, you think these children don't know, we are causing problems for them. They are struggling with it. You see parents come to church, big agwada, big car. They will sit down and they say, ah, baba, mama. At home, they don't talk. But they talk in church. And you think our children don't know. If I tell you the things that some people have told me about their parents who are pastors, you will send me from this altar. And I'm serious about it. Because we are church members, we need to wake up. Escape from reality or difficult situations. You know why I say this? Parents don't know. How many, how many men here, be honest? How many of us go to parents' teacher association meeting? Only you, sir. Only you too. Many men don't go. They say it's your mother's problem. It is not true. It is not true. And when the boy now wants to feel jam form, it is the father that tells him what to feel. When he doesn't know how good the boy is. Dealing with stress, unpleasant issues. When they now get to school, you are telling them to read geology. When the boy is good in fine art, he will be struggling. You will not even know that he's not in school. Many parents send their children to universities. They haven't been there before. 
You know, Nigerians now carry their children to Canada. <laughs> I'm sorry for Una. Particularly, Canada is a country that almost liberalizes everything. They passed a law early this year in the state of British Columbia. Cocaine is illegal, but if you have two ounces, you are okay. Can you imagine that? Also, in some countries, they call it harm reduction. They say instead of buying it and using it at home, come to a center. We will give you the needles and the drug. You can use it. That is where we send our children without supervision. Some of them are not. I remember when I went to America, my cousin and I were the only, and the husband were the only people going to school on our street, Nigerians. Others, they drive taxi. One carried me one day. He brought out six wraps of marijuana. He said, I should carry two. I said, why? Because they give me a ride. So I said, no, because in California, you can carry a few wraps. It's legal. So he wanted us to share. So the police stopped us. I carry my own. He carry on. I said, just let me drop. I'll go enter a bus. We have to wake up. The values we give to our children are the values that will help them when they are not with us. Next slide, please. I'm uh, sorry. To fit in with friends or certain groups. I don't have time. I've told you how that happens. Maybe when you ask me questions. Availability and affordability. There is none of this thing that is not available. It depends on the money you have. That is why you see many of our children, they steal. They carry things that don't go. Have you seen somebody who sold a car in the joint for 25000 Come with me to joint. I should come and take some of you. Come and look. If I take women to joint, they will cry for that day. Because there's no way they can understand why children should be like this. A man will be renting bench in joint for two hours. When you saw this, oh boy, your name don't reach. Okay, I beg. Next. It's a very, this is what I, I've been in this room for about 30 years. I know what I see. And the world and is getting worse by the day because we are all careless. Ignorance, peer pressure. A mother's parents will be sending their children to, 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 to school, secondary school at age eight, to go and do what? And then they'll go to university at 13, 14. To go and be doing what? And you say he will not get under peer pressure. He will get under peer pressure, he will use drugs. They brought one boy to us. One Monday morning, I said, the parents, you bring him. They came with him, 20-year-old, final year, computer science, Christian University. So I asked him, what's the problem? He looked like it. I said, don't worry. When you are with me, you can talk. The father said, oh, they, 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 they suspended him. The last one month for marijuana, I've been carrying him around. So I don't allow him. So I said, hey. I said, oh, boy, what do you use? The boy looked like this. When he began to call the names, the father almost fainted. He didn't believe. He said, you want Nikon? <laughs> and I asked the boy, when was the last time you used? He did like this. He said, Friday. Ah, ah. The father said, where? He said, at home. At home. Next slide. So what are the signs you look out for? This may not just be it. I'm not saying when you see this sign, it means the person is using. But it raises your sentinel. Reddish or rheumy eyes. Our children are so smart. They have found out that when the eyes are red, you may know they go and buy Vicin. You know Vicin eye drop. When they put it, the redness will clear. So you will not know. Use of strong menthol sweet, Baba Blue and Tom Tom. They use it to suppress the smell. But let me tell you today that some drugs, particularly the perfumed marijuana, you can take and you will not smell it. Somebody said yes. <laughs> Poor school performance and dropping grades. Somebody who is A, he begins to drop. There's something wrong. It may not be drugs, though. That's what I mentioned earlier on mental issues. You may think children don't have mental issues. They have. The strain you put them through by the course you tell them to read, by the situation back at home, 
It puts them under stress. Truancy from school or work or church. They don't follow you to church. They say, go, I'll meet you there. One day I went to one of our churches. I won't mention the church. As I was entering, I saw a young boy come. The trouser was like this, not a member of the church. He stood at the entrance and he picked his phone and called, and the girl came out of the teenage church. And the girl followed him. And I can tell you, the girl will come back before they finish church. <laughs> he follows you to church, oh, it doesn't mean that he's in church. Seeking to be alone. Frequent change of friends. They change their friends regularly. You don't know their friend. Many parents don't know their children's friend. When you don't even know your children, how can you know his friend? Lo loss of interest in surroundings or previously enjoyed activity. Somebody used to enjoy football. Used to enjoy to sit down with that and suddenly begins to withdraw. Something is happening. Unkempt appearance. They don't care the way they dress. They don't. If you come to join, you see somebody wearing one slippers, one color, the other one different color. You see them in pants. You call them area boys. I, I know. Wearing dark glasses, even in closed spaces, in church, in the house, they'll be wearing dark glasses. Next slide. Next slide, sir. Um, Let's leave the because I, I've left the presentation and I think it's in the program so you can go through some of these things so that I don't believe I want to run to some important things. Next slide, sir. What is the role of the family? Because that's the important thing. You know, I mentioned individual family. The, the normal, the thing bothering Nigeria today comes from the family, the failure of family system. So when you say Nigeria is not good, look at yourself very well. How did you contribute to it? Avoid making excuses for them. Oh, no, 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 not my child. I don't think he can do that. You go to the school, you beat up the teacher. Or you don't know they do it. Uh -huh. There are some schools. The teachers cannot touch the students. No, they can't because they pay big money. Don't take over their responsibilities. They are home. They don't do anything. You cook for them. The houseboy will clean their room. We clean their shoes. We clean their mouth for them. And... What do you expect? Involve them in decision-making about matters affecting them. Don't take, no matter how little, don't say, I'm your father, I know what you want. You don't know what he wants. Please discuss. I'm not saying abdicate responsibility, but please sit down, let him understand why you're taking a decision. Do not be an enabler. One girl came to us and left. The mother was sending her money behind us. Enabler. You, there was a student, I think I mentioned it at the last time I spoke to the pastors. In a Nigerian university, they did a surprise check on students. They found $2 million cash on a student. Cash on a student. When they called the father, the father said, ah, how did you have up to that amount? Which meant that if you had 500, they would not worry. How, what would the child be doing with dollars in school? Enable, enabling. Be supportive of desire to stop or find help for them. Be emotionally... You know what most of these children say to us? They don't see... They don't know their parents. You don't come home on time. You wake up to go to work. I'm not saying it's not good to work. But the reason why you are working is for the children. Don't retire later and begin to carry them around. It's a pain that no man should go through. Have a family altar. When you pray together, you can be able to guide them and then they find spiritual deliverance. It's not when they are now on the way, you say, let's go and do deliverance. Could they work? Never compare your children to your other children or children outside. They're different. Even twins cannot be the same. Please let us know that. The fact that your son is not reading medicine does not make him any less better. Wallace Shane can read literature. There's no place in the world they don't know him. Seek professional help. Please you know, endeavor to be their primary role model. You know most of them, who is your role model? They will go and be mentioned the musician. How can that be your role model? The, role model, the musician will know correct. Have you noticed that many of these young musicians are dying? That's the problem. 
Next slide, please. Role of the church. The church must acknowledge the reality. We are in big trouble. And how do we do it? We must speak about it. There's no hiding it, oh. If we hide it, we... Look, you know what I worry? If we don't do something for our children today, there will be no church tomorrow. They will not come. Who will be in the church that we are building if they are not guided today? Make drugs and other social problems uh, alter matter. You know, if you don't talk about it, they'll be doing it and they'll be comfortable. Yahoo, Yahoo. Do you know in uh, those days they set up the mothers of Yahoo, Yahoo? They have an association. If you don't know, they do. Two days ago, they caught a young boy who had the head of his father and mother. Oh, you didn't read about it? Oh, you should. You should. Endeavor to set apart a special worship day. That day, there will be no sermon. You just sit down, tell people to send their questions without putting their names and deal with those questions. I went to Abuja to talk in one of our churches. I wish I brought the questions they asked me. A young girl said, since my daddy takes, why are you telling me not to take? My father sells now in Chocho. It's not outside. The church must not be judgmental. It's difficult, but God can lead us there. Ensure a constant reinforcement of this learning. When you are talking about, revisit it again and, and talk about it. You know, when you begin to do these children will come out and tell you. And as long as you don't stigmatize them, they, you will see people come and tell you. But when we stigmatize, I don't play with that child. You know the father is the, the, then we are creating problems. Make sure to support the victims and their families. We need to support them. Set up or reinforce the counseling unit. I, I guess you have to counsel. And can I say something? The fact that you have a counseling unit, it doesn't have to be headed by a pastor's wife. It can be headed by anybody who has empathy, who loves children, who they will not fear. Because when they see pastors where they will not talk, they will not. Even no matter how terrible the problem is. Actively discourage stigma. I'm saying it now. Any one of us can fall into error. You know, the church is very, if you say husband and wife have a problem, they may say, don't come to church again, or something, something. We can't do that, because we don't know what is happening in each person's life. Encourage members to seek for professional help as soon as possible. Next slide. Ah, conclusion. My people, there is no way I can tell you enough what those two issues have become to the church. There are too many people in the church that are griping, that need help. Can they find help in your church? I'm not talking about welfare. Look, many times that we give them rights, that's not what they want. They want someone to listen. And let me tell you, counselors, there's a difference between hearing and listening. You cannot be listening to me and playing with your phone. That's not listening. They, you will lose them. Can we genuinely find people who love people, who care about people to handle this? The church has issues. Let us face it so that we may find peace. Thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can we give, uh, can we please give God a round of applause? <laughs> louder, louder, louder. That was great. Very, very great. Now, I know um, we have questions. Um, Maybe we should ask it openly. You, you want to ask any question? Can you please raise your hands? And if you don't want to ask it openly, please um, just write it and um, just write it and uh, pass it to the ushers.
um, our, facility, our guest speaker will deal with the questions. Please, let's do that in the next um, one, two minutes. While writing our questions, we want to bless God with our offerings. And to lead us in giving our offerings to God is our own mommy in this region. Please, let's welcome our mommy, the wife of the pastor in charge of region, mommy or Susan. Please don't stop until mommy takes microphone. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's time for offering. Choir, please help me. Choir, you are not ready. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, it is with much pleasure that I praise your name. just want to thank you giving us this opportunity to be alive today and to be able to attend this conference we thank you for being able to give our offerings lord we ask that lord you will bless us and bless our offerings in the name of jesus we pray oh lord god almighty that this our offering offerings we set about a fire in us in the name of Jesus. We thank you because you have given us this opportunity. We are grateful, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. We have two questions here, sir. The first one says, uh, can we say everyone in our society today is mentally sick? 
um, the person uses Lagos as a case study. Because if you get to motor parks, schools, markets, everybody is hostile and aggressive. So um, it, it, can we say that everyone in our society today is mentally sick? Hello? No, it's not true. I understand that question. There's a difference between mental health and mental illness. So I want people to know. We all can have different stages of mental illness, but mental health just means that somebody should be in a state of mind that he's functionally okay in terms of what he does. But again, as you have said, sir, there are moments of momentary insanity in all of us. When you suddenly get, you know, the Bible says anger dwells in the bosom of fools. When you get another, you are momentarily mad. No, I mean, I don't mean madness. You know, madness is, mental illness is when you lose contact with time, context, and everything. No. So it's not true that everybody is mad. But the thing is, we have different moods and situations. And also, people who have mental illness are different. But let me also say, insomnia or depression, which I mentioned the other time about a lady, those are mental illnesses. They may be mild, they may be moderate, they may be severe. But the ones that people know openly are people that are not wearing clothes on the street, that are walking around. Those people have lost contact with reality. That is a different ballgame, but you can't say that everybody is mad. But we have different moments of uh, exhibiting our madness, if I put it that way. So the fact that in Lagos everybody is annoyed is the, is the time. And, you know, that's why we need to be careful. Because you don't know the way somebody is feeling, and that's why you see them abroad. That somebody, can you imagine that somebody can enter a 13-year-old? He got to his class. He shot his classmates. After killing eight of them, he sat and he was trying to listen to, to class 13. But again, it's a progress. You know the, what you mentioned, sir, is that if we don't watch it as a nation, we are moving towards that. This is something the person needs professional help. Alcoholism is one of the most dangerous conditions under substance abuse. And it is because it is socially acceptable. You know, if somebody drinks, you are not likely to worry until he begins to fall around or beat his family. That's the problem. And you know, the thing is, the person who is alcoholic, and I tell you this, frankly, they want to stop. They truly want to stop. But the thing is the grip. You know, octopus, you know, when an octopus grabs you, you can't escape. And what usually happens is this. <clears throat> truly, the person stops. But if he, go to, if he goes to a naming ceremony, what do they serve there? Alcohol. If he goes to a housewarming, alcohol. On the street, he sees alcohol. So the law is always there, even if he wants to stop. So what I would say to that person, if he can bring that son to our office, we will see what we can do. And let me also say this. When you see people with alcoholism or substance abuse disorder, People think the best way is just take them away. No, that's not true. If you take them away to another place, in 24 hours, they will locate. 24, I don't know how they do it, but they will locate. The important thing is, we need to interrogate why. Many of them, you don't take away the reasons of why they went into it, they will keep going back. So that person, if he sees us, we will try and help him and see what we can do. Uh, um, uh, our office, our office is number Kadam number five. Yusuf close, off Sadiku Street, off Amara Ulu Street in Agidingbi, behind the Zenith Bank. If you know Tomo Beach School, our office is around there. So if you come any day of the week between ten and four, but the person must be willing to stop. The person must be willing, and then we, God will help us to help him. But I know he can stop. You've answered the last question, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. God bless you. There is another one that was written, um, a woman talking about her husband. Um, 
I want to beseech the woman to see her father in the Lord, the pastor in charge of the province, um, the pastor in charge of the region. Her daddy, in his wisdom, will um, tackle that, and the problem will be solved by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I just want to especially appreciate Dr. Adedeji. Some years ago, in 1992, in the parish where we were then, we were both sent out of the church to go and start another church in Surulere. And to the grace of God, I mean to the glory of God, that church today, in fact, for some years now, it has been a province headquarters. So, Dr. Dokun is well known to me. There's a part of him that all of you don't know. Because in those days, he used to carry one very big Bible. So when we are going for evangelism, there's nobody who will see that Bible. You will wait and, and listen to it. Praise the name of the Lord. But we also want to mention that Dr. Adedeji is the head of the Christ Against Drugs Abuse Ministry, Kadam. Kadam. You know, it's a ministry of our church, the Redeemed Christian Church of God. So Dr. Adedeji is the one heading it. So we, yes, if you want to clap, clap. Because through that ministry, the Lord had uh, redeemed many people. I still remember one brother. He used to walk the streets. But it was after he got to Kadam that the Lord rehabilitated him. Today, he's a parish pastor. So, sir, we deeply appreciate you for coming today to bless us. And we have a plaque here for you, a word of value to Dr. Dukwandideji for the important presentation at this year's Champions Fire Conference. Praise the Lord. Have we been blessed at all? Amen. If you have been blessed, put your hands together for Jesus. Amen. The church is becoming dynamic. That 